This episode is brought to you by Wear Buff, your go-to for Buffalo-inspired apparel. Get your hands on stylish t-shirts, hoodies, and more at wearbuff.com. That's W-E-A-R-B-U-F dot com. And make sure you use the promo code TWB at checkout for 10% off your first order. Stay Buffalo proud with Wear Buff. Our 2023 positional review series continues today with the wide receivers and the tight ends. This week on the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. And now listening to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast with your host, Justin Goddard. Bills Mafia, welcome into another episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Buffalo Fan Base Podcast Network. My name is Justin. I am your host today. And we are continuing our positional review series. Um, so far, we've covered the quarterbacks and the running backs in a previous episode. Uh, if you want to check out, you know, kind of my thoughts on the whole roster, you'll have them by the end of this. Um, And this is reviewing, you know, productivity from last season. So we're going to be looking at, you know, what everybody was able to accomplish last year, um, who we've lost from that batch, who we're replacing them with, and kind of what my expectations are um, in that regards. Um, Before we get started, I do want to say this show is brought to you by Wear Buff. Um, We have a link to Wear Buff right on our website, wanderingbuff.com. Dot com. Um, some sweet shirt ideas. We're rolling out some new ones. Um, right now we do have a pride shirt out there. Um, there's just some other designs to support the Wandering Buffalo. So check that out while you're headed that way. Wanderingbuff.com. We got some articles going up over the summer. Um, just trying to keep the content moving throughout the off season. There's like a ton to talk about and like not much that's changing at the same time so uh make sure you're checking that out gonna try to do some interesting articles um some throwback stuff coming out so make sure you're checking out the website make sure you're checking out where buff um and i want to start right out with the tight ends i i wanted to do the tight ends and the wide receivers together for a couple different reasons um one pretty obvious you know these are all the primary pass catchers really we've already covered the running backs um but two they're like super dichotomous as position groups in that like the tight ends were returning basically exactly what we had last year and the wide receivers were returning basically nothing from last year um so i think it's it's kind of interesting to put them together it's also you know one group that will kind of breeze through and um, one that's going to be a bit more of a thought exercise. Um, so the big two for the tight ends, obviously Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox, um, rounding out the group is Q Morris and then practice squad players from last year that are as of now returning as well. Trey McKitty and Zach Davidson. Um, I'll start by saying, I think the two of them being on our practice squad just kind of shows the depth of this position. Um, I think that they would be solid tight end threes on most rosters, and they're just kind of waiting in the weeds for us. And, you know, a lot of people out there might not be too jazzed up about, you know, just having a super stellar tight end room. Um, But I think this is one of the situations where the Bills try to be a little bit ahead of the curve in the NFL and kind of like anticipate trends that are going to be happening. Um, And I, I I don't know how quickly it'll happen. I don't know if it will happen, but I, I kind of feel like the NFL is going to have this shift of going back to, you know, heavier personnel, uh, the running game being more featured and, it's for a couple of reasons, and we've seen some of them with the Bills themselves. Um, but one being, you know, just the success defenses are having of like with the cover two shell, kind of like an almost full time prevent defense type deal going on, um, where they're just not allowing explosive plays. They're allowing you to cut, uh, like catch the ball underneath, come up and tackle. 
Um, we saw the Bills kind of at the forefront of this type of deal. Um, and just like limiting the explosive plays, um, lighter linebackers, you know, more emphasis on the pass game. Um, so you see, you know, a shift back to two tight end sets and, you know, a, a more aggressive running approach. And we, we saw, you know, one of the most aggressive rushing offenses over the back, back half of last season under Joe Brady. Um, my other main reason for this is with how much the passing game exploded in the NFL, like it, it's no longer enough to have you know, just that bona fide number one receiver. You need a, a threat at number two. You need depth throughout three and four. And, and like, you need all of these guys to, to be affecting the pass game. Um, and when you see like the talent necessary to have that and what these wide receiver contracts uh, are starting to do, I think there's, there's just got to be kind of a, a shift in the philosophy. Um, Cause right now you're already kind of stretching the budget to, be paying one of these top guys when you see you know Jefferson just got you know 35 million a year 150 plus guaranteed um and when you start having a roster that has like two of that caliber receiver like you'll get by paying one um hopefully you have a franchise quarterback and then you got to pay the second receiver and all of a sudden you're talking you know half your salary cap is going to be tied up between three players um, and I think if the league just continues on that trend, like something's got to give eventually, um, <clears throat> tight ends, I think, I think a productive tight end in that position, kind of like not really shooting up in valuation in, in, in the NFL just yet. Um, if you, if you have one of those, you know, top tier tight ends, you're going to, you're going to get that wide receiver production, um, for like half the cost. Um, so I think the bills are kind of ahead of the game here. Um, just looking at some of the stats from last year and I'm going to start with Dalton Kincaid. I think he's set up to have an absolute monster season. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of kind of transition, uh, in the first off season as a rookie, you, you go from, you know, training for the combine, you know, running in a straight line, doing all those workouts that, you know, they're tools for evaluation, but they don't really translate to, you know, direct football workouts and doing football related activities. You know, it's great that you can run fast in a straight line, but how do you move? What's your football speed type deal? Um, that combined with you know, just just all the shocking changes coming in as a rookie. And then he was also rehabbing a back injury last year. Um, I feel like last year at the beginning of the season, he was kind of used as like, like almost a possession receiver, like a check down option. It was kind of like get him the ball on two, three yard passes and kind of let him create after the catch. And then towards the tail end of the season, I think we saw more of what we expect him to be. And it, it was more of like a down the th field threat, more of a primary option on plays. Um, and his numbers showed it. He ends up 73 catches on 91 targets, 673 yards and two touchdowns. Um, and that ends up being, you know, kind of his historic rookie tight end season, top 10. Um, and that was with a bit of a slow start. Um, I expect his numbers to absolutely go bananas. I'm expecting him, you know, 30, 40 more targets, um, the touchdown numbers to come up, the receiving yards to come up, just, you know, him and Allen kind of developed that chemistry of being reliable down the field. Um, and not just being, you know, kind of like an underneath zone beater type guy. Um, so expecting huge things from Kincaid this season. Um, Dawson Knox, I know a ton of people are down on Dawson Knox and his numbers last year, you know, just looking at stat sheets 
it, it's hard to argue against in that fashion. But he did have a weird year last year. Um, only played in 13 games. He was dealing with the wrist injury that needed a surgery. Seems like he kind of came back from that a little bit earlier. Seems like the rehab from it was taking longer than expected. And he kind of, you know, rushed back because Kincaid was dealing with a concussion and wasn't going to be able to play. Um, But ends up in 13 games, uh, 22 catches on 36 targets, 186 yards and two touchdowns. Um, And yeah, especially for his price tag, having just got that contract, like these... These aren't impressive numbers. Um, I do think that a little bit of his drop issues showing up again last year that we kind of thought were put to bed. I think a lot of that does have to do with the wrist injury. Um, You know, you're not, this isn't a guy like casually playing catch in the yard. He's getting these heaters from Josh Allen thrown at him and, you know, your your catching mechanism of your wrist and your hand, it's, it ain't feeling right, and you're catching these absolute piss missiles from Josh Allen 10 yards away. Um, for somebody that already didn't have the most sure hands, checks out for me. Um, I think the interesting thing is he still comes away with the two touchdowns on, you know, a third of the targets of Kincaid and ends up with the same amount of touchdowns. And I think this is the type of role that. Dawson Knox is absolutely going to thrive in. Uh, I think he still brings a ton to the team in the passing game um, and even more so in the blocking. And then we've seen Josh Allen and Dawson Knox have really great chemistry in particular on, you know, like the broken plays, um, you know, deep in the red zone when they run like a triple option with Knox leaking out. And like we saw that set, we saw that success even more so before Kincaid was in the building, which is, you know, what makes me lean into even more that last year was kind of like a weird year for him with the injuries and everything. Um, But I fully expect, you know, when defenses start having to game plan for Kincaid and like that's your big threat on the team and, oh, yeah, we have to worry about a tight end too. I think particularly in the red zone, Dawson Knox is really going to thrive, and I ex- I expect him to have maybe not like huge receptions and yards this season. Um, I expect him to kind of cherry pick some touchdowns, that number to go up, you know, like the five to eight range. Um, I will take a moment here to say that I I've kind of been working through a, like a full stat projection. Uh, I've never done this before. I'm going to have that episode coming out when we wrap up this series. Um, It's really friggin' difficult (laughs) to do, and especially with, you know, how this wide receiver room's being retooled. Um, And, you know, the the fifth fifth and sixth receivers on the team kind of up for debate. Um, But I'm going to put it out. I want to have some fun with it and be able to look back on it and see how we did. And it'll be something that continue do doing going forward and kind of match them up year over year and just see how wrong I am because I, I, I'm, I'm not a football expert. I'll say that on the show all the time. I'm a football fan. I love talking football and, and that's kind of just what I do here. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't expect to be horribly accurate, but I, I want to see what it looks like by the end of the season. Uh, but at any rate, Q Morris is the tight end three. He appeared in 15 games last season. Only two catches on three targets for 26 yards, but one of them was a touchdown. And I have like supreme confidence in Q Morris as a tight end three. We've seen him in a couple instances, you know, have to get a little bit more playing time due to an injury. Um, and I, I feel like he just pretty consistently makes, you know, the, just like this one random big play, um, contributes on all phases of special teams. Just, you know, for a tight end three, love having the dude in the building. Uh, the wide receiver room is where we get 
a bit more difficult. And I'm just going to run through some numbers here real quick. Um, and obviously, you follow the Bills. You know where I'm headed with this. You know how many how much turnover we have here. Um, so not on the roster anymore. Diggs played in 17 games, 107 catches on 160 targets. 1,183 yards, eight touchdowns, one carry for five yards. Gabe Davis played in 17 games, 45 catches on 81 attempts, 746 yards, seven touchdowns, uh, one carry for negative two yards. Um, Deontay Hardy, which I'll have to say was my biggest disappointment last year. Um, I... I envisioned him as, you know, the Isaiah McKenzie replacement on steroids and ends up playing in 16 games, uh, only 15 catches on 21 targets, 150 yards, one touchdown. And then the one that I didn't even realize was the numbers looked like this was four carries for zero yards. Um, like I said, I, I was expecting him to be involved in, you know, some jet passes and some end arounds, things like that. And, you know, just was an absolute no show. And I know he was, you know, coming back from a turf toe injury, um, but just just didn't look like he was bought in towards like the middle to later half of the season. Um, and then Trent Shearfield, I was also excited for to a lesser extent. Um, but 11 catches on 22 targets and 86 yards and one touchdown. Um, so obviously the only carryover from last year was Khalil Shakir. Um, also played in 17 games, had 39 catches on 45 targets, 611 yards, two touchdowns, and one carry for 10 yards. Um, just that efficiency from Shakir super excited about going forward um and then the people coming in to replace them i i don't plan on doing this for every position group of you know like looking at their stats from last year um just you know being with a different quarterback different system um different team having different success uh there's just so many factors around them but there's a couple players in here in particular, uh, Curtis Samuel and Chase Claypool. I just kind of wanted to lay out the numbers of, of what they've been able to do in this league, just for kind of some context. Um, and then think about the idea of, you know, translating it over to Josh Allen. Um, so Keon Coleman, obviously coming in, uh, first selection from the Bills this year. Hoping for big things from him, but no no stats to look back on from last year. Um, Curtis Samuel comes in as you know the biggest free agent that we signed this off season, um, and he's somebody that's been productive in the league with just not good quarterback play. And th this makes me think of you know some of our <laughs> some of our Bills favorites throughout the drought of like. Lee Evans and Steve Johnson and Eric Moulds and these dudes that, you know, were able to put up great numbers and, you know, we're just never really blessed with great quarterback play. Um, and we see some of these guys that have been brought into the Bills that, you know, have a bunch of talent, but, you know, didn't succeed elsewhere and had bad quarterback situations, whatever. And I think of like Smoke Brown and Beasley and, um, Emmanuel Sanders to a lesser extent he he had some good quarterback play and was successful um but Curtis Samuel last year 62 catches on 91 targets uh 613 yards four touchdowns um also added seven carries for 39 yards and a touchdown there um and kind of that little bit of running game we saw him involved in the running game with Joe Brady in Carolina um, I, I expect an uptick in that from both him and Shakir, um, just that, that extra layer of something for the defenses to think about. Um, 
Marquez Valdez Scantling, 16 games last year, 21 catches on 42 targets, 350, or I'm sorry, 315 yards, one touchdown. Uh, Mac Collins had 13 games last year, 18 catches for 18 catches on 30 attempts for 251 yards. And finally, Chase Claypool. And I will say that I, I've done this right now with kind of my 53 man roster projection um which I did I did that exercise to be trying to be predictive of what the bills will do um I've talked about it a lot on this show that I I have very tempered expectations for Chase Claypool um I think it's easy to be saying and doing all the right things now uh you know look good and look good in shorts in you know OTAs and things like that um but Claypool I I wanted to dive into not just his last season um because that last season was all over the place he was with Chicago he ends up in Miami he has eight catches on 21 targets and a touchdown but I I was kind of more interested in looking into his past production um, uh, because he he was a high draft pick selection. He was a second rounder, um, to Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh doesn't really miss on receivers. And you think about some of the guys that they've drafted and the success they've had. Um, so I just kind of wanted to look at his three years with Pittsburgh, and this was with you know tail end of his career, Ben Roethlisberger and kind of just compare him to, you know, a Gabe Davis because just because we lost Davis and, you know, we lost Davis size and some of his blocking ability, some of his physicality. And for people that are like super concerned about that, if we can recapture anything of what Claypool was, um, I think you I think you have that guy, and he's competing for your wide receiver six spot right now. Um, so Gabe Davis is 6'2", 216 pounds, um, and speed-wise ran a 4.54 four at, at the Combine. Uh, Chase Claypool, 6'4", 230, and ran an even faster 40 at uh, 4.42. Um, his three years with Pittsburgh in 2020, played in 16 games, uh, had 62 catches on 109 targets, 873 yards, nine touchdowns, and he also added uh, 10 carries for 16 yards and two touchdowns. And then 2021, played in 15 games, 59 catches on 105 targets, 860 yards, two touchdowns, and 14 carries for 96 yards. And 2022, uh, played in eight games for them, 46 catches on 79 targets, 451 yards, one touchdown, uh, nine carries for 59 yards. Um, all that to say, like I said, kind of tempering expectations here. Obviously, had two seasons after that that were, season and a half after that, that were just absolutely disastrous. Um I'm I'm not going to get myself too excited here. I I look at this as a reclamation project. It's kind of like the idea of you know come to Buffalo and be the best version of yourself. But I like looking at what he was able to do in Pittsburgh because I I think I think Pittsburgh and Buffalo are kind of similar similar teams in the way they like to run their organization and it's kind of like that you know, like the blue collar city that, you know, the team often reflects, you know, like the people of the city, just kind of like that gritty, hardworking, you know, no nonsense in the building type deal. And I think, you know, Tomlin and McDermott kind of run a similar ship, you know, with that in mind. Um, so am I banking on Claypool coming in and, you know, 
knocking everybody's socks off and he ends up being, you know, like our wide receiver two or three or something like that. Uh, I, I don't expect that, no. Uh, but I think there's a world where he, you know, could have his act together, you know, stay on the right track and everything and could be really productive as like a wide receiver four or five, something like that. And so part of the reason I wanted to make some of these Gabe Davis comparisons to him um, is looking at it through the lens of like how awesome Gabe Davis was and how much we loved him when he was like the wide receiver four. And, you know, you had to plan for the guys ahead of him and, you know, he was getting the matchups, he was getting you know, lost running downfield, things like that. And I think with some of the speed dynamics of having, you know, two, four, three guys, um, Shakir being a fast and twitchy guy, and the idea of Claypool kind of being an afterthought, I do think he could end up making some actual noise. Um, I, I've been doing this <laughs> really tough balancing act with with myself of like knowing knowing what I think of Claypool as a player right now and you know if you listen to previous episodes you know it being a low risk high reward signing that I wouldn't have done um and then having that match up with you know looking at his his previous statistical years and like damn that like that's that's a guy that was, you know, sniffing at thousand yard seasons twice in his career. Um, a guy that put up a bunch of touchdowns. A guy that's had, you know, and I won't even say like moderate. He's he's been pretty successful in the NFL, and then just kind of not even fell off. It was you know silly on on the field and off the field stuff that kind of ran him out of Pittsburgh. Um, Chicago, I, I kind of put that as a wash. You know, it it was a very not good team to turn <laughs> to to join. Um and we've seen, you know, very little success from receivers outside of um DJ Moore in Chicago with Justin Fields. Uh and then he goes to Miami, you know, mid season and it didn't really do anything there and I, I think that was similar to what the Bills are doing right now, just the low-risk, high-reward signing. But they're doing it like mid-season. You already have Tyree Kill. You have Jalen Waddell. You have all these fast guys, and you're trying to acclimate to a new system. And I, I think if there's a chance of him succeeding, it's, you know, with the full off season, you know, kind of just resetting his career. Um, so told myself I wasn't going to do this. I've spent my most time talking about a possibly wide receivers and <laughs> six on this team. Um, but I, I think there is room to get excited there, but just to temper the expectations. Um, so how do I feel about this room as a whole? Um, this, this was fun for me to do and also frustrating because it, it's to me by far like the biggest unknown on this roster and it's just with so much overturn here and I can talk myself into you know I don't love some of these guys some of them aren't really household names like we're really banking on a lot of guys you know making a pretty major jump going to a different system um, but then I can have the other side of it where I'm like, some of these dudes are a little bit underrated. You know, what are we really replacing? Um, you know, the idea of spreading the ball around and everybody eating and, you know, maybe we don't have a receiver that gets, you know, 120, 150 targets and a thousand yards. Um, but that's with in mind, you know, Kincaid's likely going to be the major target target getter on this team. Um, Curtis Samuel, I think he can 
make huge impacts with, you know, lesser touches than having to funnel 150 targets to digs. Um, I think when you look at, you know, full off season for Joe Brady and having some of these explosive weapons and the success that Samuel had in an absolute dumpster fire organization, um, at the time in Carolina, um, you know, I don't think Joe Brady ever deserved to be fired in Carolina. I think he was a Matt Rule scapegoat. Um, but Curtis Samuel had a thousand yard year with Joe Brady in Carolina. Um, now I know there's been some injuries and some age adding up. Um, but last year, you know, we, we had it right here. He, he went for 613 yards. Um, just a terrible commander's team. Um, so I think there's lots of reasons to get excited for Curtis Samuel. I think Velda Scantling, I don't think he's, you know, ever going to be an 80 target guy or anything like that. But when we look at some of the production that we're replacing, like Diggs and Davis, obviously the big two, um, I expect Shakir to take a step up and replace some of that. I expect Samuel to replace some of that. Not even factoring Coleman yet, the uptick from Kincaid. And then it if we can expect, you know, a little bit of an uptick from Curtis Samuel, maybe he gets to like eight, nine hundred yards. Um, we look for a step up from Shakir, you know, more targets. Maybe he gets in that eight, nine hundred yard range. Um Kincaid having an impact in the passing game. I mean, what we're really looking for from, you know, this combination of like between, we'll call them wide receivers four, five, and six right now, between MVS, Hollins, and Claypool, what are we really looking to replace if we if we get that step up from everybody else? You're you're talking about replacing, you know, about 25 catches and 250 yards from Hardy and, and Sherfield. I think we're going to get far and away more than that from some of these other guys. And maybe I'm wrong again. I, I was really excited for Deontay Hardy. I thought he was going to have, you know, something like 500 yards, some explosive plays, you know, still, you know, a limited role on the team, but I, I, I thought he was going to have a big impact. Um, if we're looking to, you know, just get minimal impact from these guys and that kind of top four, including Kincaid, takes some of those steps and has some of that production that we're expecting, I think on paper, it looks like we're significantly worse than last year. I think in practice, if the spreading the ball around approach is is successful i think we could have quite a few players on this team that are you know going down to like the fifth receiver on the roster that's having a pretty significant impact and i i guess i'm using pretty significant a little bit loosely here but when we're talking about you know the wide receivers four and five that we're replacing last last year we got next to nothing from them and not only did they kind of have some paltry numbers, um, but there was also, you know, he drops, some lazy route running, uh, just a lack of trust in these guys. Um, I'm not expecting MVS to have a huge role on this team, um, but I think when you mix in all the different options that we're going to have in this passing game, I think he's he has the ability to be um, effective downfield. So how do I feel about this position group from last year to this year? Um, I feel okay. I have lots of question marks that won't really be answered till we see actual football start being played. Um, what would I, you know, add to this now and going forward? Um, I honestly... As of right now, I wouldn't change anything unless it was something major. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with this group going into next season, and it's a lot based on I trust Alan 
to kind of get the best version of these guys uh, out of themselves. Um, as far as the room goes, I've talked about this a little bit in the past. I just don't see any major changes happening um, before the 2024 season starts. Uh, I mean, there there's still some whispers out there of like trading for a Debo Samuel or a T. Higgins or an Ayuk. And I just, I don't think that Brandon Bean decided to eat all this cap space and kind of reset the cap and, you know, reset the timelines in some places just to go out and give up future assets to then have to pay a receiver $30 million again. I, I just don't see that happening. And then when you look at some of the free agency pool left out there, I just don't think there's anything floating around that's going to really change how you feel about, you know, your top four-ish receivers. Um, I, th I think any move you s you would see at this point would be kind of to compete for like a wide receiver five or six role. Um, and as I just kind of broke that all down, I, I feel really good about what we have um, going one through six. Um, I think the top end of this depth here could be upgraded, but I think that's what you're hoping um, Keon Coleman ends up being. And maybe we don't see it completely in year one. Um, I think you... The hope and the plan is that you see that going into year two, year three, and kind of build out the room around that going forward. Um, so I, I'm pretty comfortable with where it's at right now, um, both like for myself and predictively. I, I just don't think we see um, any, any changes there. Uh, but that's going to wrap it up for those two position groups. As always, drop a comment. Let me know what you think about these two rooms. Uh, if you think I'm missing the base on anything, if I'm too high on a guy, too low on a guy, um, love to have a conversation. And if you have made it this far, as always, I ask that you like, share, subscribe, do all the things, tell a friend, help spread the show around. Um, like I said, we do have a ton of stuff in progress. Um, so make sure you're checking us out on YouTube. Uh, make sure you're subscribed there. Um, lots of highlight videos coming out. We're doing a whole bunch of throwback stuff, looking at some of my fa favorite players from the drought. Um, just all kinds of fun stuff we got going on this summer. So make sure you're subscribed so you're not missing any of it. I uh, thank you again for joining me on this week's episode. And as always, go Bills.